I want to thank my president for a very generous introduction. He's a kind man. And he was being so nice. And Earl Cleveland leaned across and said, you can do all those things, but you can't sing. <laughs> two comments behind that. <laughs> One is, if we can have ladies like that, I don't need to say. <laughs> and the second thing I'd like to say is that I can take that from Earl Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> My message today has disturbed me. sincerely pray that I that you'll at least understand the spirit in which I bring it. The title is Assault on the Tower. Last fall I was taken in a car with Eldon Mrs. Woodfork to a wild animal preserve in Kenya. And very soon we encountered herds of giraffes and swarms of warthogs, zebra, large herds of wildebeest and other creatures. Mrs. Woodfork wanted desperately to photograph a lion. In spite of all the animals we were seeing, she wanted to see his royal majesty in his own domain. At one point as we drove along, I looked out across the veldt and I saw an unusual mound or tower, an eminence. It was bald and on top of it standing shoulder to shoulder and flank to flank were four wildebeests. Obviously, they were sentinels looking after hundreds of their grazing companions. These sturdy bulls were silhouetted dark and strong against the azure sky. Their horns looked like crossed sickles, and they hardly moved at all. I think this is what caught my eye above everything else. They were as still as death. It indicated for me the diligence necessary if you're going to be a watchman. National Geographic magazine tells me that bulls and stags and stallions often guard their harems in this manner. They will choose high ground so as to be able to look favorably to the four winds that they might perceive advancing danger. This indicates that watching for the sentinel is more vital than grazing. We drove near these grand animals and discovered a lion resting on the opposite side of the road. That lion seemed perfectly unconcerned and detached. We continued our interesting journey and about an hour later we doubled back and these four beasts were still standing there but the lion had crossed the road. And when we noticed him, he was stalking through the tall grass, being careful to remain upwind. And we saw that he was headed straight for the watchman. Several cars had stopped their engines 
camera eyes were peeking out into the grass. This giant cat would creep a few feet and then pause his tawny hide matching the tawny grass. Stealthily he moved. Patiently he advanced. Timing for him was very important. His instincts were honed by nature and experience. I have seen yard cats do this. <laughs> Trying to mesmerize birds and lizards and mice. And one thing you know when they're doing it, they are all business. <laughs> this was an exciting spectacle. The zebras in their exotic clothes had seen the lion cross the road. And now every one of them within sight was standing still with head high, ears pointed forward, and all eyes set on the lion. The zebras were on the right side of the road. A half dozen ostriches were off to my left. Their strange bodies Necks looking like poles topped by weird little heads. All of them were watching the lion. On he crept. Headed for the watchman. Sometimes the lion seemed to disappear altogether. Then he would re-emerge. He was an unrelenting adversary, crouching low, waiting for opportunity to spring. And those bulls stood lazily, only their tails switching. For them it seemed that flies and insects were their biggest bother and threat. As a matter of fact, they were so complacent it appeared that they misunderstood the solemnity of their calling. They had lost their sense of urgency and didn't understand the danger. They had been standing there so long. Two of them finally resigned from the tower, probably considering their vocation dull and unremunerative. They probably felt that things were so uneventful on the tower, it was better to crop dry, dead grass and chew on that. And two remained. And on came creeping death. A strange bird that we could not identify, like an angel of caution, hovered in space as still as a he helicopter. The wind was prevailing and he only had to flutter now and then, but he did not move. And occasionally this bird screamed her warning, but the bulls were indifferent. The one in the most imminent danger finally shifted to the safe side. The other one turned and looked directly toward the lion, but couldn't discern the danger. And as his head swung back around, he stroked his cud as though to say, peace, peace, when there was no peace. And then he looked away again. And the whole herd was relaxed. All of their heads were down. Gathering for their bellies was top priority. And the lion moved ever closer. We sat motionless under the African sun. And in our hearts, with our cameras ready and our fingers beginning to tremble, we wondered, how long? How long? And then we saw those dark ears change. He laid them back against his neck. Mrs. Woodfork was peering through her single lens reflex. A shudder of tension shivered through the fauna hosts. All of them sensed the trouble, the drama unfolding, except the watchman. And because the herd trusted them, they were oblivious to the danger. For a moment, 
I wished that zebras and ostriches knew how to scream. Somebody needed to cry aloud and spare not. Somebody needed to say, destruction coming. Suddenly, there was a blur of brownish terror. Suddenly, a furious propulsion of power as death armed with fang and claw bolted, assaulting the tower. The prime target, the complacent watchman. Sharp, hooked claws reached for Frank. Blindsiding this sentinel, but mercifully, his instincts took over. Perhaps he smelled what he could not see, and his sharp hoofs dug into the dry gray earth. The dust swirled like little sun devils, and at the same time, there was a distressed snort, and hundreds of heads jerked up. The grazing ended. The herd was alerted, their eyes flashed and roared in fear, their nostrils dilated. The tasteless, dry morsels of immediate gratification were not important now. Desire failed. Survival was all that counted. Death with opened canine maw unleashed all of its potential fury. The zebras flinched and whirled, beating a tattoo with their hoofs as they went off in the opposite direction. Ostriches turned and made off at 35 miles per hour in ungainly flight. And suddenly the lion pulled up in frustration and Mrs. Woodfork whispered, Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> the old bull had just barely escaped. The enemy was thwarted. And we started to drive away, only to stop suddenly as hundred, hundreds of wildebeests panicked and got down to business. They started bolting for the right side. It was like a revival. It stopped traffic. <laughs> the thunder of their hoofs was answered by the antiphonal applause of zebra hoofs banging the parched earth, the old lion tried again to look harmless and laid down, frustrated to be sure, but with a keener, meaner appetite. And with feline devilment in its brain, he must have started planning the next assault. How shall I take the watchman? and scatter the herd. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth, that's the only word, and warn them for me, when I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, and the wicked man shall die in his iniquity, his blood will I require at thine hand. Yes. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. The safety of the herd, the congregation, the constituent members all across this nation are depending on you and upon me. One great preacher said, if the town clock is off, a thousand watches will busily tick in error. There will be late appointments all over town. Employment lines will form too late. Business deals will be deferred. 
the horses won't get fed on time. The constabulary will oversleep. Women and babies will cry. Dinner schedules will be off. Markets will not open on time if the town clock is off. In a time of war, the first business of the advancing troops is to take the sentries. Do away with the pickets. Get rid of those who might sound the warning. My brothers and sisters, my message is simple. Ellen White says the devil despises God's workers. He hates you more than anyone else on earth. She says we are his prime target. She also says his first attack is usually against your morals. He wants to make you make a fool out of yourself. And failing here, she says, he will attack your property, your family. He will seek to discourage you and cause you to murmur against God. Henry Mitchell was writing for the Washington Post the other day and he said some Active people have more virtue than is good for them. And then citing Jim Baker and Swaggart as examples, he said these are men who had excessive concern for virtue and it usually defeated itself and wound up as vice. Mr. Mitchell said they carried on about the evils of sex and pornography until these things became a severe obsession with them. The very filth they roared against became sweet in their own minds. He went on to say it is this very concentration on the supposed sin that leads to the obsession. And we can talk about it until we are hooked on it. He said some are so obviously grounded in virtue that they find others, even quite dandy people, with opposite views, offensive, but we call it pluralism. He decries those who make lists of bad and good. And then he says lies are always put on the bad list until one day without a lie, the most awful damage takes place. Yesterday's heresy becomes today's accepted belief. What Mr. Mitchell is doing is rationalizing. He says that some fanatics will bomb airplanes and buildings and justify it by their religious principles. And on and on flowed this dangerous rationalism with its euphemisms and its compromising, its ludicrous liberalisms and its snares. But this is the way people are thinking. I read a long time ago that most criticism is subjective. Men who always harangue about some seductive sin is usually surely guilty of it or sorely tempted with it. But ladies and gentlemen, that's not supposed to muzzle us. For with all, there are the musings of God that are put down on leather and vellum and paper by holy men. And these things are absolute, immutable. They are verily truth without equivocation or apology, without the slightest disposition to compromise, to comfort the flesh. And they always come with the affirmation from God, my ways are not your ways. Don't be surprised if you don't think as I think but strive to do so. And with every unalterable command, God gives the assurance, if you will to do it, I am able. All my biddings are enablings. Now Mrs. White says the ministers, the workers, the sentinels, the watchmen, are the enemy's prime target, and then she has women his prime weapon. 
There are two major attacks that are made incessantly. Women and money, not necessarily in that order. I uh, have heard through the grapevine that you've had quite enough stormy, powerful, powerful discourses on these two sins. And I promised myself I wouldn't dwell on them. But each darling, seductive, evil excites impulses so strong that they can obviate the intoxicating appeal of the other, and they are not to be taken lightly. Ellen White says, fooling with women is like witchcraft. It's bewitching. It's captivating. It's entrancing. It's enchanting. It's titillating. It's tantalizing. He wraps his web around you. It's an addiction. And I will tell you further, it would do us well to be scared to death of it. I don't know what the future holds, but I can tell you that over all these years I have said, Lord, if I don't smoke that first joint, I'll never be an addict. If I don't drink that first swallow, I'll never be an alcoholic. And if I don't touch that first one, by your grace, I and my children can keep our heads up. To play that game is to place into the soiled hands of a holotrous woman your credentials, your reputation, your family's peace, and the honor of God and his church. Then this unworthy adulteress is sitting, as it were, at the computer of your existence, punching buttons that determine whether the rich nerves and the bruised hot strings of your faithful wife shall flutter. She determines the destiny of your family and sometimes whether your children will go to heaven or hell. That woman without principle determines whether your own heartbeat will quicken. She holds a spell over the entire church and she turns our members against all of us because they either hear about it or they sense it in powerless sermons. Benjamin Franklin said that's paying too much for a whistle. In other words, it just ain't worth it. And then there is money. The money that we get must be blessed. Or Haggai said, you will feel the breath of God on it. And you'll put it in a bag with holes. And I have observed that all of those who steal from the church or the members or acquire wealth through questionable means never get ahead and they never get out of the hole. My dear brothers and sisters, with godly fear, I mention these things. And I pray every day, Lord, hold on to me. I read something I found almost incredible, and the rest of my message will relate to it. Testimonies to ministers and gospel workers. Ellen White said in 1884, by the way, the reason it was incredible, she is quoting the devil. And listen to how she puts it, Satan talking. As the people of God approach the perils of the last days, Satan holds earnest consultation with his angels as to the most successful plan of overthrowing their faith. 
while holding the popular churches under his control, he directs his angels to lay snares, especially for those who are looking for the second advent of Christ and endeavoring to keep all of God's commandments. That's us! Revelation 12, 17. My brothers and sisters, this is no game to be taken lightly. Why do we play around? This is why complacency is so deadly and why the Lord's servant says those of us who relax in a time of war are under a fatal delusion. And now she quotes him. Says the great deceiver, it is third me, Satan talking to his imps. Says the great deceiver, we must watch those who are calling attention to the Sabbath. That's us. We can't do what the other brethren in other communions do. I had one take a young lady from my tent to the movies to keep her away from the truth. He can go, but I can't go. The same, quoting, the same light which reveals the true Sabbath also reveals the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. This must not hold their minds. One of the greatest sermons I ever preached in my life, I heard last night. And there was something in it about prayer and study and meditation. But Satan says, let's not let them dwell on this. Let's hold their minds. In Daniel 2, one of the most familiar prophecies for us in all the Bible, the stone eventually comes out and smites the image on its feet and then grinds to powder the gold, the silver, the brass, and the iron. Hasn't that ever bothered you? That is what I'm going to preach about at DuPont, Pastor. Hadn't that ever bothered you? We left the gold and the silver and the brass long before Christ was born. We were through with the iron in 476. Why then does the Bible say that the stone hits the thing on the feet but still grinds the gold and the silver and the brass and the iron? Yes, sir. Come on. Come on. It is because the elemental juices of Babylon and Medo-Persia and Greece and Rome have flowed down through the ages. And the toes gather from Babylon, religious confusion and idolatry. The toes gather from Medo-Persia a propensity to pass what they call irrevocable laws and to persecute and throw people in lion's dens who want to worship God according to the dictates of their own conscience. And the toes gather from Greece this obsession with human rationalism and education and logic and existentialism and intellectualizing. borrowed all these and crowded her pantheon with so many gods they didn't even know how many were there and through the arteries and veins of world powers all the way down to our day have come all of these corruptions and the weak and sordid toes are full of the gold and the silver and the brass and the iron and when Jesus comes he's going to take care of all that as he takes care of the toes. Attack on the tower? You mean Satan can do that with education? I told you all last night, I don't mind being understood, but I fear being misunderstood. Perhaps if I put it this way, I believe in education. I've spent more money on it for others than I have for myself. My family is educated. Believe in it. I admire it. 
as long as those who are thus powerful are also motivated by the word of God and live by faith. Ellen White says rationalism is an idol for it exalts human reason above the word of God. That's when you're in trouble. And right now, if a millionaire should stand up out there and say, Brooks, go on sabbatical and get a doctorate. I'll pay for it. I'll support your family, pay your rent, everything. I'd go. And I might study English or history or administration or speech or sociology or communication, but I would not study theology, either applied, systematic, or contemporary. For I have seen some of our best minds tinctured by this, spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit. My critical watchmanship would make me wary. In 1 Kings 3 and verse 3, the Bible says Solomon loved the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, you all understand that, don't you? Solomon loved the Lord, 1 Kings 3, 3. Then you go over to 1 Kings 11 and start with verse 1. And the Bible says, Solomon loved many strange women. <laughs> and they turned away his heart from following after God. Now, I'm not going back to that first item. I'm talking about something else. My good friend taught me how to deal with this woman in prophecy and to spiritualize if I please. And we've come to the place we're infatuated with many strange women. We're giving hospitality to abominations in the name of religion. We admire the great apologists and spokesmen in office. And these things can lead our hearts away from God. For many, the objective of the sermon is to arouse feelings rather than faith. We find ourselves compromising. We want to be Dr. Feelgood in the pulpit. And we ignore the mandate of the three angels' messages. We get our material from the radio and from books while we neglect to study this truth that has made us what we are. I've come to the conclusion we need to study subjects we already know well because they need to be repeated. We need to study until we can preach the second coming 12 different ways without essentially repeating ourselves. And every time you do it, you are strengthened and your congregation is too. On page 422 of that book it says we must work this Satan, I should quote Satan, we must work by signs and wonders to blind the eyes to the truth and lead them to lay aside the fear of God and follow custom and tradition. It's Satan talking. And in our church today, there is an affinity for and a hunger for healing and raising the dead. Our music is intended to do only one thing. Page 473, Satan talking. Our principal concern is to silence the Sabbath keepers. We will enlist great men and worldly wise men on our side. I stuck my foot in it last night. I, I didn't realize that a Roman priest was in our midst all day long. I don't have any desire to hurt anybody's feelings. And I might have said a couple of things a little differently had I known, but I didn't. But since I've gone that far, <laughs> Ellen White says, quoting the devil, many will come over to our side. Heard my associate preach about this. He said the prophecies tell us that many will leave the ranks of the Lord during persecution and join hands with the enemy. He said the problem is so many are already gone and persecution hadn't even started yet. <laughs> many will 
come over to our side. But before proceeding to extreme measures, this Satan talking to his ears. We must exert all our wisdom and subtlety to deceive. We can separate many from Christ by worldliness, lust, and pride. You all have to forgive me. I got all my stuff out of Spirit of Prophecy. Go ahead. Worldliness. You don't have to go to the disco to be worldly. You can be worldly in your study. Lust, lust of the flesh is more powerful than lust for the flesh. Pride, listen to this one, Ellen White. Many are stretching beyond measure to win the praise of men. Such is a spectacle that crucifies the Son of God afresh. And the enemy approaches the tower. We want to be praised. We're in competition with each other. Got to out-preach somebody. Ellen White goes on to say they may think themselves safe because they believe the truth but indulgence of appetite on the lower passions will confuse the judgment and destroy discrimination and cause their fall. I jumped all around in that book on page 160 she says the great advantage of ministerial institutes now I put this one in here because that's what this is Yes sir. Yes, sir. yes, sir. She says the great advantage of ministerial institutes is not half appreciated. These are rich in opportunity, but do not accomplish half of what they should because those who attend do not practice the truth which is presented in such clear lines. And that's what makes the men who stand up here feel as the man said last night that our ministry is meaningless. Page 162. Why is there so little power in our churches and efficiency amongst the teachers? Because known sin in various forms is cherished among the father. There are a lot of people who got it but they don't cherish it. They cry day and night for deliverance. That's one thing. It's another thing to cherish it. She said they cherish it even among those who preach the word. Unless there is reformation, they better leave the ministry and choose some other occupation where they will not bring disaster to the people of God. The audience out there is waiting on us to sound a warning. I don't believe it's all right to go to the movies now. I don't believe it's all right to drink. You not only must not believe it, you got to say so. And you got to say it with power. Amen. Satan talking. I'm back over to page four something, 470 something. Go. Make the possessors of land and money drunk with the cares of this life. Present the world before them in its most attractive form. Prevent those from obtaining means who are preaching the word of God. Keep the money in our ranks. This is all from Spirit Prophecy. Satan says to his imps, keep the money in our ranks. Get in the way so that breath of life has to leave Sunday morning. Go on Monday at 8 when everybody's at work. Keep the money! So that men can't run their efforts and advertise as they should. Yes. Keep the money. Yes. But look, devil, what are we going to do with it? We don't use money. Get it the bank out. Yes. And oral. Yes. Yes. Page 278. Let not money be obtained by touching or sanctioning any unclean practice. Back 
over to page 473, I think it is. Make them, Satan talking, make them care more for money than for the spread of the truths which we hate. Satan doesn't mind somebody being on the air talking about Jesus. He talks about Jesus. It's the truth which we hate that he wants to preclude from the TV and radio diet. Keep the money so that they won't have any efforts. Or at least they won't have enough money to finance them. Keep the money on our side. Let the preachers go out and get side jobs. No, wait, wait, wait. A man has a deep problem, a new baby coming. If he has to do something to pull himself back up in the line, I'm not fighting that. But I'm talking about men who go to work every day for the school system. at the realtor's office. Oh, I'll leave that. Page 474. <laughs> Lovers, listen, listen, listen. Satan talking. Lovers, of, you didn't know all this was in there, did you? Some of you read it. Lovers of pleasure are our most effective helpers. Those of this class And intelligent will serve as decoys to draw others into our snare. Brethren, forgive me, I have to do this. Now I'm trying to just touch on some of these things that assault the tower. Words. Fundamentals of Education, 457. The atmosphere of unbelief is heavy and oppressive. The giddy laugh, the jesting, the joking, sickens the soul that is feeding on Christ. Cheap, foolish talk is painful to him. Now, I know and teach that there's a place for humor in our... You see, when you stand up there laying these heavy truths out, tension builds. And humor used effectively is like a safety valve that relaxes. I'm not against that and I've heard some of you do it with mastery. Nothing wrong with that. But Ellen White said, I tremble for fear lest I shall belittle the great plan of salvation by cheap words. And she says, those who do too much of this in the pulpit lead the audience to conclude that the requirements of Christ are less strict. Conformity to the world is a greater influence on worldlings who are in our midst. Satan says, don't preach standards. And the Lord said and says, thus they will separate from Christ. You know, we have to preach these standards whether we want to or not. They hold us. They oblige us. When I do evangelism, you know, and I go to visit somebody, I want to oblige them to come out. I want them to say something, then I hold it over them. You said you'd come. And when we preach God's standards with love and mercy and sympathy and empathy, these things oblige us. I'd be a fool to talk about adultery the way I talk about adultery and then do it. Y'all pray for me. Ellen White says, those who don't will separate from Christ. Then, they will have Satan talking. Then they will have no strength to resist our power and he alone will be ready to ridicule their former zeal. Page 283, the frequent cause of failure amongst our workers is failure to take time to pray and to regard themselves as in need of divine help. 
I heard some time ago that a lot of kneeling down puts you in good standing with the Lord. Without prayer, we're not going to make it. In spite of our intentions and our determination and our strong will and our individuality and everything else we think is a plus, without prayer, we're not going to make it. I don't care how far we've gone in this direction or the other. God has fixed it that way. He said we should not cease to pray. And prayer is a discipline. It's not natural to want to pray. you got to pray anyhow. You ever get ready to get to bed and you dread to get down first and pray? Prayer is a discipline. She goes on to say, these regard themselves as great men and this ends their desire for divine enlightenment, the only thing that can make us great. They extinguish all chance for true greatness. Page 474, as I come to my conclusion now, until a great decisive blow is struck, our efforts against these people must be untiring, said the devil. We must be present at all their gatherings. In their large meetings, especially evangelists, Satan talking, in their large meetings, especially our course will suffer we must exercise much vigilance and employ all our seductive arts to pre prevent souls from hearing the truth and then satan talks about himself and his role i will have on the grounds my agents if we can keep souls deceived for a time God's mercy will be withdrawn and he will give them up to our control. We must cause distraction and division. We must lead them to criticize. Can't y'all see this lion? Sneaky, dirty, low down. We must cause distraction and division and lead them to criticize, to a judge, to accuse, and to condemn one another, to cherish selfishness and enmity. For these sins, God banished us, and all, all who follow our example will meet a similar fate. I could hardly believe I'm reading Satan's own musings. Now in closing, Ellen White says at the end, God's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But God never makes a mistake. He will not call men good and faithful who are not. Oh, but my brothers and sisters, I got some good news now. Devil hasn't been given carte blanche. Paul said, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful. Oh, I'm glad God is faithful. One night a lady needed me at the hospital, and I had to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and get myself together. I had to shake my head and try to think straight so I could talk to her on the phone. And after I'd finished my prayers, just before leaving for the hospital, it occurred to me that our God, whom we serve, neither slumbers nor sleeps. You don't have to wake him up. He doesn't have to clear his head. 24 hours a day, heaven is open for business, and God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are evil, but will with the temptation also provide a way to escape? Oh, my brothers and sisters, you don't have to do it. <laughs> you don't have to do it. I don't have to do it. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me. Because I want to do it, but I don't have to do it. Devil doesn't have carte blanche. Page 440. 
if you do not know whether you are converted or not, then never preach another discourse from the pulpit until you do. I've learned that especially as I get older, that every watchman needs a shelter. So I began to look in some books. You got a tower around the city. The people are behind high walls, but the watchman is exposed. But then I noticed how they built them. Every wall in every tower has a stone fence around it. There's a place for even the watchman to take shelter. For every watchman needs a hiding place. Psalm 61 verse 1, David said, Hear my cry, O God, from the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. Lead me to that rock that is higher than I, for thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. In Psalms 18 and verse 2, he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. In 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, the apostle said, You got to watch yourself because your adversary, the devil, goeth about seeking whom he may devour. But in Proverbs 18.10, the wise man said, The name of the Lord is a strong power. <laughs> if one of those field beasts out there in Africa could have somehow opened his mouth and cried, Jesus, that lion would have gone the other way. <laughs> the name of the Lord is a strong tower. And the apostle Paul was signing off. In 2 Timothy 4.17, he said, notwithstanding. All this stuff that's going on and all this suffering I've gone through, having my own associates forsake me, leaving me here in this cold dungeon, suffering, suffering with my thorn in the flesh, and even though I've only tried to do good, the highest authority on earth has looked at my record and judged me worthy only of the chopping block. But he said, there is a righteous judge. He's going to give me a crown at that day, and not to me only, but to all those folk at Oakwood College in 1989. If we just hang in there, now he's signing off, and he said, notwithstanding. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood by me. Ministers forsook me. Church members turned their back. People talked to me like I was crazy. Treated me like a dog. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood by me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known. I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Come on, say amen up here. Amen. Paul, you mean you encountered lions? I thought that was Daniel. Oh yeah. I encountered a lion, and the Lord shall preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. He not only delivered me, but he can keep me and preserve me so that I don't spoil. He can keep me until he sets up his heavenly kingdom. And now this man about to die breaks into a doxology. He said, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel? Why not deliver poor me? Yeah.